I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Welcome to episode 173 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we are featuring three wonderful authors who are nominated for an Agatha Award this year. Unfortunately, Malice will not be held in person again this year. (laughs) Very so bummed. (laughs) It will be, I know it will be back next year. I hope so. The Agatha Awards, as usual, have still plotted on. We have chosen three wonderful authors who are nominated. We have done this for the past three years. We always try to pick authors that that we've never interviewed before. We give everybody a fair shot. The ones that we've interviewed in the past, you could go back and listen to our other Malice Martha Agatha nominees and hear some of what they have to say. First up will be Esme Addison. She is nominated for Best First Novel for A Spell for Trouble by Crooked Lane Books. Next up will be Catriona McPherson. She is nominated for Best Historical Novel for The Turning Tide. That is put out by by Quercus Books. And last but surely not least is Christina Lane. She is nominated for Best Nonfiction for Phantom Lady, Hollywood producer Joan Harrison, The Forgotten Woman Behind Hitchcock. That is put out by Chicago Review Press. Enjoy! We would like to welcome Esme Addison to the program. She is nominated for an Agatha Award for Best First Novel. Welcome, Esme. Thank you very much for having me. Well, Esme, since you are nominated for your first novel, can you tell us a little bit about your novel? Okay. A Spell for Trouble is a cozy mystery series based on the very real Polish myth of the Mermaid of Warsaw. I was inspired by my husband's culture and my family-in-law, who are in Poland now, kind of delved into that history, culture, and mythology to create something that I thought would be fresh and different, but still have the nice kind of cozy feel that I love. You know, that's funny. My husband's family is Polish. I don't think I've ever heard that one. Yeah, I have found since I have written this that a lot of people that have Polish ancestry have not heard of it. (laughs) My husband hadn't heard of it. (laughs) Oh. He tells me I know more about his culture than he does sometimes, but (laughs) I'm a researcher, love to read, and I love history, and I like mythology. I love learning about different cultures. To get kind of into the nuts and bolts of the story, it's at the heart, it's about a young woman. Her father has recently died. She leaves a high-pressure job in Manhattan. And she reconnects with her aunt and cousins. She's been estranged from them because her father felt that they were somehow to blame for her mother's drowning when she was a child. So she heads down to this small coastal community in North Carolina where she discovers some secrets about her family, secret history and interesting facts about their family. Well, I love when books incorporate things that you learn a little bit about the culture. I'm looking forward to reading this. Oh, thank you. Got all the Polish food that my mother-in-law has ever cooked for me in our family. So there's a lot of... Oh, so what are... Name some of them. I bet I know them. (laughs) (laughs) Just different types of... Pierogi. Pierogi's is actually in book two. The first one, it's very heavy on pastries and cakes and cookies. Kolachki's is one. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, my mother-in-law lived with us two years before she passed, and we had a lot of Polish pastries. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so you will probably recognize something, because I'll put the actual term, the Polish term, and then I describe it. Because sometimes people may know something, what it looks like, but not know the actual, like, the authentic name for it. You, you'll probably recognize some things in there. <laughs> Do you include recipes? I do not. I've had many people tell me I should. You know, it's not really a culinary cozy. So it's set in an herbal apothecary. And so it's very heavy on herbal remedies. I make my own remedies as well. So I probably should have included like different herbal remedy teas and for various maladies. I didn't include any kind of recipes. I do blog about some of the food on my website. Oh, okay. Herbal remedies would be something I'd be interested in. I love herbal remedies. I have three sons. Ever since my second son was born with allergies, so that was 13 years ago. So for 13 years, I've been very into making herbal remedies for my family whenever they have any kind of like sore throat, colds, topical ailments, anything. At this point, I kind of know most of the things. In the past, I would research and try to find a natural way to resolve the issue before I would head to the drugstore. Oh, and so yeah. I like using natural remedies for things if I can. Fortunately, now, you know, you can get a cough syrup that actually has a honey base or something that has elderberry. You would have to like, you know, make your own syrup. And <laughs> so that I don't have to do any of that anymore, which is nice. There's a lot of that in the story as well. Do you have a herbal remedy for COVID? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. I do what I do like for cold season. Whenever I feel like I have a cold coming on, I just load up on zinc. Which oh, is yeah. oh, yeah. My mother-in-law always swore by that. It's worked for me for colds. Like, if I feel like a little tingle in my nose or a little itch in my throat, I'll take zinc lozenges, like, every couple of hours until it's gone. And, you know, if I can get it quick enough, it works. Well, Esme, we'd like to know a little more about you. Can you uh, tell us how you got started in writing? Like most writers, I have been writing probably since I could hold a pencil in my hand. I have always loved to read, always loved to write, and I always knew that I would be a writer. For a long time, I just wrote for myself. My dad always told me that I need to make it a goal to be published. And I never necessarily wanted to be published. I just liked to write. And I would always write the books that I wanted to read. And eventually, you know, you do what, what you do. You have an agent, you get your work pitched, and have the book sold. After I decided that my dad was right, I should try to be a professional author. <laughs> I have wanted to have my books in stores and in libraries, and th that's been like the best for me is to, like to go walk into my local library and see my book there, which is like amazing. I, I posted a picture on my Instagram account of that day, <laughs> holding my book. <laughs> uh, also going to my local Barnes & Noble and seeing my book there and autographing copies. But I've always been a strong believer that if you can't find the book you want, write it. I love cozy mysteries because I never thought I would write cozy mysteries. I thought I would do like southern fiction or historical fiction something like that i discovered cozy mysteries a couple of years ago and every time i would read one i thought i want to write one too <laughs> i'm gonna create my own little city my own cute little town have all the quirky characters and all like delicious food and i couldn't stop thinking about creating my own cozy so that's actually what i came out with first that's, that's really great let's hear your reaction when you found out you were nominated <laughs> i was shocked because there's so many authors out there. I, I was just very like humbled and grateful that enough people thought well enough of my book to nominate me. I was just very surprised. It was very nice. That's great. Do you have a website where people can find you and your books? It's EsmeAddison.com. That's easy. Well, Esme, <laughs> we thank you so much for being on the show today and we wish you the best of luck. We are so sad that we're not getting to go physically to Malice this year. We go every year. It's just such a neat community. But maybe next year we'll get a chance to meet you in person. All right. I would love to. Yeah, I was very disappointed last year. So my book came out last year and I was going to Malice. And then this year, maybe, but one day. <laughs> yeah. Here's another question. Are you working on the next book? So the second book comes out in July. It's called A Hex for Danger. That's written and on its way to stores. And then I am currently working on the third book. Oh. Very good. We wish you the best of luck and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. It was really nice talking with you. Bye, Esme. Goodbye.
<laughs> we would like to welcome Catriona McPherson to the program. She is the nominee for the Agatha Award for the Best Historical Novel. Welcome, Catriona. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Can you give us a little background of Dandy and her story coming forward? Yes. She is a gently born aristocratic, minor aristocratic yes. lady. She's English. She lives in Scotland. She's married to a very doer. Scottish man and she had rather a wonderful First World War. She worked in a convalescent home and she was out and she was doing things that were worthwhile instead of just parties and correspondence. And so after the end of the First World War, the thought of going back to that humdrum and frivolous life didn't fill her with any kind of joy. So she took on a case to help a friend who was having a spot of bother with something. Solved a murder, as so often happens in these novels, although never in real life, I don't suppose. Slowly but surely, she has merged, sort of moved into becoming a bona fide private detective. I don't think they've quite got business cards yet. She can't quite bring herself that far, but she now rackets about Scotland solving crimes with her friend, Alec Osborne, and her husband harumphs in the background, but doesn't do anything to stop it because she's making a bit of money. That's who she is. Her husband, Hugh, seems to be the person to go to when they need information, though. He knows everything. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's really... They find that really annoying that he's... And he loves it, of course. They do nine tense of the work and then they sometimes lay it out for him and he with fresh eyes sees it. He doesn't have much humility which must be very irritating uh, for Dandy <laughs> and Alec. <laughs> How do you do most of your research? Are you a internet surfer or do you go visit these places? Well, ordinarily, you know, before this last wee while, I would always go and visit the places twice. Once when I'm trying to get a whiff of the story in the air, kind of find the tale of the story, I'd go and visit a place and just sit on a rock, sit in the rain, usually because it's Scotland, and <laughs> just look at the view and wind and listen to the bird and wait for the story to come. And then after I've written the book, inevitably, I'd go back probably about a year later, and find out the stuff I actually need to find out. Now, this book, The Turning Tide, thankfully, I had had the idea for this book, I think 20, mm, 2018 or 2019, it's set about 10 miles from where I was born and where I grew up. So I know the place. So not being able to go back for that second visit hasn't been as bad as it might otherwise have been. I mean, it's set at the mouth of a river with a coastal island, an island that you can walk to twice a day, Cramond Island. And it was somewhere that you, know, you can imagine as teenagers that was what you did. Went to Cramond Island and either really tried not to get cut off if you were a good girl or tried accidentally on purpose <laughs> to get yourself cut off oh, if you were Mom, the other girl. The other girl. Yeah, <laughs> In the turning tide, you hear rumblings of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi oh, movement yeah. coming into fruition. The series going to continue through World War II? Well, do you know, I would always have said no. This is book 14 and book 15, which is set in 1938, is written as well because, you know, we're always so far ahead. I had always said, I don't really want to write about the Second World War. I tend to set the books in settings that I'm interested in researching. So department stores, that was fun. Or, you know, a convent that was a laugh. A psychiatric hospital, less so, but interesting, you know, not fun exactly. But I always thought that I don't really want to. And then it feels so inevitable, especially because Dandy Gilbert's got two young sons of fighting age. As I've been writing my way through the 30s, there's this real like distant thunder. Here it comes, here it comes. And so I started to buy books and memoirs of the time and started to get my head around it. And then read a couple of novels set not in the war, but on the home front. Jill Peyton Walsh wrote Lord Peter Whimsey and Harriet Vane story called, no, oh, it's on my shelf behind me, Oh, Presumption of Death, set during the Second World War. And it was just so wonderful. And I thought, you know, I'm not going to be on the front. Dandy is now past the age of working in a field hospital. There's not going to be any of that. I could probably really enjoy this. So yes, my husband, when I say I'm worried about the boys, my husband says, you're the writer, just don't kill them. You don't need to worry about these <laughs> fictional boys. He's not a writer. I mean, sometimes you can feel something bad coming in a draft and you don't want it to happen but you know it's gonna and there's nothing you can do about it. You get very invested in these characters. Yeah. One of the things in Turning Tide I laughed out loud Dandy is dealing with the babies. 
Oh. <laughs> she loves Thank the you. babies, but she's not used to having them around. No, well, Dreaming no. all when, the time. Loves them yeah. the exactly. When she had her babies, they were washed and put into little ribboned gowns and brought down for half an hour, and then they went away. So this, her daughter-in-law, Mallory, is modern. You know, she yes. sacks her nurse. She wants to be modern and then decides it's quite a lot of hard work and drafts granny dandy in. So, yeah, I had a lot of fun. And you know what it's like? You do know what it's like. You're holding this baby and it's screaming its head off and glaring at you. And you do look down and go, what? 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 <laughs> yes, exactly. What do you want? Well, let's move on to the Agatha Award. You have oh. seen to won so many awards. Does this ever just become... 